Hey Web3 TV friends, my name is Ornella Hernandez and today we are covering the Sigma and AIBC Eurasia event in Dubai. I am sitting here with one of the attendees, Jaguar. How are you? I love your name. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for having me. Jaguar, so as CEO of Jaguar Regan Comp, I wanted to just ask you, what is your role? What do you do on a daily basis? Tell us more. Thank you. Uh, well, Jaguar Regan Comp actually does uh, via myself and my team as well, we incorporate high-risk companies in various countries, some islands, some European countries, in Dubai as well, and in Germany and Switzerland, which are the more mature one as well, but as many other countries on the process over there. So we do incorporation, and then we have to do international taxation because usually the entrepreneurs are not residents in the countries in which we do those incorporation. The point of the co my clients is to be legit, naturally, so we are searching for... Naturally. <laughs> naturally, of course. Otherwise, they wouldn't need me, right? So we're looking for countries and nations and uh, places in which they can be legit and to be regulated uh, in countries that will have a more enabling kind of regulation for high-risk companies, such as gaming, crypto, AI mainly, which is a new thing coming. So uh, we do that, the incorporation, the international taxation, and then application for licenses. Most of my clients need um, a financial service provider kind of a licenses or CASP, crypto asset uh, service provider licenses. So we do the application for, for licenses. Uh, because we train regulators, we kind of know what the regulators would require, so it's easier to do that. And then director services, et cetera. I think the, the whole phase, phrase for that would be corporate services for high risk industries, crypto, fintech, AI, and gaming. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you. You are the CEO of Jaguar Reg and Comp. <laughs> this is a legal advisory, correct? Yeah, legal and CPA, accounting, taxation, international. Okay, advisory. so tell me how you make this world of regulation and compliance fun oh, it's, for all of us. <laughs> it's exciting, not only fun, it's really exciting um, because I only deal with high-risk industries such as AI, artificial intelligence, fintech, as part of fintech crypto, blockchain industries, gaming, and all those you know um, areas around that which are high-risk payments as well. So what's exciting about that compared to any like real estate or marriage or things like regular ones, I'm kidding, is that um, there's not enough regulation and it, when it, it is, uh, it's not clear enough. So there's a lot of uh, regulatory ambiguity. Yeah. And when it is ambiguous, the lawyer part of myself has like a playground to play. We can create new things. That's my accounting part, accountant part. And it's a, we, we can build new things. It's like playing Lego. <laughs> in many senses, seriously, because you, you, you create structures, new ones, and you follow these laws, but you're uncertain about the other laws, so you make a statement, you take a pose, you know, you take a point, and you want to defend that vis-a-vis -vis the regulators. Yeah. And many of the times I train regulators in several countries, so I go and I train them to at least open their thinking and not to just say an absolute no for that. So I'm very much for uh, like an enabling regulation. Okay. So in that sense, I'm taking my small part in changing the world. Love which that. Which is fantastic. So these are all the topics that we know and love at Web3 TV, AI, gaming, crypto. So I wanted to ask what you've seen around the event today. What have you, what kinds of companies have you seen? Like, what are people talking about the most? Is it AI? Is it gambling? Like, what are you hearing? Well, I started this morning as moderating, the, moderating a panel um, about gaming and AI in the Middle East in general and in the UAE specifically. So a lot of the companies that I see here, the startups, the entrepreneurs, the investors, uh, VCs over here, we all talk about AI. I've been doing this for the last three and a half years before it's become so fashionable, uh, <laughs> regulatory advice regarding AI using the current then existing regulation. But new regulation regarding AI is being developed uh, and it is developing very quickly, mainly in Europe and in many other countries to follow as well. Just like the GDPR regulation of uh, data privacy were developing about 10 years ago, now yeah. everybody complies with that. And with Mika for in crypto, for right example. In Europe. Mm -hmm. So now with AI, the AI Act uh, has been approved, uh, re-approved uh, again in Europe uh, recently. So a lot of the companies that we see here, to answer your question, are dealing with gaming and crypto, which is the general, mm -hmm. but having an AI point to that or an AI advantage to that uh, to increase efficiency, to increase, um, to, to increase the 
finding out what is, what is fraud and not, um, okay. and to improve. So from a legal perspective, what are consumers and both corporations most worried about when it comes to artificial intelligence tools? All right, so there's the various uh, concerns uh, uh, upon which I, I protect naturally. So um, these are, first, there are the kind of companies who are actually developing and doing the research and development and creating engines, large language models, mm -hmm. uh, language. We call it either engines or models. So they're concerned whether there would be bias or discrimination or maybe the inability to screen out minors, for example, et cetera. So this is one part. There the have other been examples of that recently in the news with Google's Gemini and bias. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Not even that. Even with ChatGPT 3.5, the, the first that was um, released to the public by OpenAI, uh, I'll give you an example. With, um, with a lot of the visual models, when you were used to be writing, uh, generate an image of a successful doctor. Doctor doesn't mean a male or a female, right? right. And over 51% of the doctors in the States are females, actually. Oh. Over, right? So, but in 87% of the cases, you would be getting a picture of a Caucasian, white, male, and the age is about 40 to 50 or so, which is biased. However, people could say, why would you say it's biased? Because statistics so far, unfortunately, has shown a lot of successful doctors which happen to be Caucasian males. So why is this a bias? It's just statistics, right? On the other hand, others will say, but how do we want to educate the next generation, the younger generation, the 20 years old, Gen Y and Gen Z, etc." And the others would answer, is it our job? Is this the AI engine's job to educate? We're just presenting a current situation, sad or or, or glad, it doesn't matter, it depends on your opinion. Right. So We're still figuring that out. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. So, um, so these, the, the engine and models, the developers are worried on uh, being able to uh, comply with regulation, which is mm. ongoingly being developed. But you can follow previous uh, regulation and to see where it's going. And I, I know how, where it's going because I train regulators regarding this as well. So that's one part. Another part uh, in that phase, or that chain I would call it, would be the companies using language uh, models or, or AI uh, engines mm -hmm. uh, in order to develop, in order to train. And they train them over data sets. And right. here we get to worry about, we call it data sets hygiene. How clean those data sets are from other people's intellectual property rights, hmm. for example, or other biases, or maybe malfunctioning, or maybe uh, purposely, you know, on purpose, trying to um, train on models which are, uh, I don't know, a narrow segment of uh, the whole um, group in which uh, you could direct answers over that. Okay. I'll give you another example. Uh, one of the GPT models in the beginning, when you just ask him to write a content. Write me content about dog's food. It should be very neutral, right? Yeah. Nothing to do with it. And he would write to you about there is like uh, dry food and there is, listen to that, homemade cooked food, like on, on catering for, for dogs. Yeah, gourmet food for dogs. Gourmet food. <laughs> he wouldn't show you dry food and non-dry or wet oh, okay. or natural, whatever. He would have all the positive elements of whatever is not dry. Okay. So wouldn't you su suspect it could have been sponsored but may but by maybe catering foods for dogs, maybe? <laughs> you, would suspect, remember, you wouldn't remember it, but in the old days, when Google had been having ads or sponsored links over there before regulation required it to make sure we know it is an ad or it is a sponsored link. Right. And, and you know, in, there were the days in which ads were on the side and on side banners. Right, so nowadays well. we don't know what's an ad, what's sponsored, what's not. Well, on, on ads, on Google and Facebook, et cetera, and Meta. So we know mm -hmm. because regulation required them to tell us, the public, the consumers. On AI, we don't know. We don't even know if it exists or not, whether it is affected. Whether so, it's real or not either, with deep fakes and fake content, who knows what's exactly. what. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe real has no value to itself. Maybe let's redefine real. So yeah. it's also a lot of uh, those philosophical legal arguments of what is real. Is, is there a real reality or only what you perceive it as reality? And then what difference does it make if it actually happened or not? There's a lot of arguments, moral, 
and legal regarding this. Definitely, definitely. So this would be the users and the trainers over data sets. Um, and in the gaming, specifically in the gaming in the crypto mm -hmm. sector, more specifically, it is to find out whether it is a deep fake of a person do, going through a KYC, you know your customer right, right. kind of processes. Blockchain can help with that. Exactly, exactly. Could help with that with having a very fun, non-fungible identity in that sense that you can uh, really make sure that that transactions has happened. That's blockchain related reality. But how do you do it with the gaming? In gaming, you need to make sure the person is an adult or a resident or non-resident of a certain place. I remember the days where we could fool systems in uh, connecting via VPN through a different IP address. You can still do that. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. But on the gaming industry, mm. they have to block that. They right, have to right. know because you can't um, log in to, I don't know, anything that is forbidden in the UAE, for example, kind of an activity that you don't want to get into that. And you don't want to allow people to do that, not even using a VPN. Mm. So beware all the VPN users. Uh, it's gonna, that, those times are probably going to end sometime soon. Okay. So. And within the blockchain world, you have been working in this space for quite some time as a lawyer, as an advisor. So what excites you most about the industry right now? What, do you, what trends are you looking at? What do you think viewers should be looking at? Well, I've been doing this since 2015. So I've seen the ups in, of 2017 and the downs of 2018 and the downs of the COVID time, the 2020. And I can tell you, a lot of people get into the blockchain industry just to make a quick money of that silly thing. Where we don't know what, what it's worth, but someone else will pay twice or 700 times yeah. more afterwards. But the true pioneers of this industry have been doing this for the freedom of ownership of property, uh, to avoid censorship, um, to have it truly diversified and decentralized, having no one, no regulator, no person, no company, no corporate actually controlling that. However, in the last year, we've seen a major progress, I'm calling this a progress, of uh, getting the ETFs um, mm -hmm. approved in the U.S. and okay. in Canada and other states the as well. Big ones ETFs. Exactly. Yeah. And then that's been a great um entrance to the public knowledge and public holdings. Mm -hmm. So retirement funds and or IRAs and IRAs and pension funds would be able to be to take a part of that. And on one hand, these are capital markets regulated, controlled, government controlled in many senses, holdings of Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies, uh, other cryptocurrencies as well. So it kind of contradicts the whole concept of freedom in that yeah, sense. Yeah, and decentralization. <laughs> exactly. On, on one hand. On the other hand, it is a great bridge, which is a lot of what I do. I'm bridging the old banks, the old world, the capital markets world, to the new technology. Right, right. So it's a, I think it's a great bridge, and it's another layer of, um, of working with the blockchain. Not purely decentralized, of course. Not purely uncontrolled and uncensored, indeed. But it is another layer, uh, another part of, of uh, the blockchain industry uh, connecting to the old world and the controlled one. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. It was great talking to you today, Jaguar. Thank you very much, dear. Thank you for having me. It's been and a pleasure. Yes. And everyone, please stay tuned for more interviews coming out of the Sigma and AIBC conference in Dubai today.